My name is Mike Wilson, and until that night I thought my life was pretty good. I had no idea that he was about to descend into hell. Overnight, everything I loved was either taken from me or threatened to be taken from me. However, I survived and over the years I found comfort in one particular Bible verse. The race does not fall to the swift, and the battle does not fall to the strong, and food does not fall to the wise, and wealth does not fall to the wise, and favor does not fall to the learned, but time and chance happen to all of them. I married Jenny Smith three months after graduating from college, and we had been married a little over seven years when Jenny completely betrayed me. I looked through every minute of our married life that I could remember and found nothing to indicate that my life was about to turn into crap. I was completely stunned. Jenny and I met in college. She was very attractive, about five feet six inches tall, with brown hair and emerald green eyes. Jenny wasn't overly gifted, but in my opinion she was perfect. On a scale of one to ten, with ten being a goddess, Jenny was a nine, maybe even a nine and a half but she had a charm that simply attracted people. Jenny owned me body and soul in Hello, and we worked so well together, and our goals seemed to align perfectly, or at least the goals that Jenny talked to me about. Anyway, we dated and eventually got married. I'm six feet tall, weigh about 190 pounds, and have sandy brown hair. My social life was quite active in high school and college, and I had my fair share of bedroom romps. I would never be confused with a sports star or a movie star. However, every now and then I would get a second look from a lonely woman. I won't bore you with a long story about how Jenny and I met, I'll just say that we met in statistics class. Over the next 18 months, we became two peas in one pod. And right before I graduated, I happily landed a good job, so our future looked very bright. One thing that should have alerted me was that Jenny was very reluctant to take me to meet her parents, John and Alma. I didn't realize until after the wedding that Jenny was completely ashamed of them. In fact, I believe I would never have met them if I had not insisted on talking to her father before asking her to marry me. For a day or two, I thought we were on the verge of parting. But then Jenny gave in and arranged for us to meet her parents at their home. At this meeting, I learned that Jenny grew up in a very poor family, and she was very ashamed of it. But to me, I thought they were wonderful people, and Jenny had no reason to be ashamed. They were warm, sympathetic, and very friendly. They didn't have much, but they were always willing to share the little they had. My father died when I was 14, and my mother when I was 20, so I came to love John and Alma Smith as my real parents. They lived in a small house in an old, not the best neighborhood. It was a one-story building of just over a thousand square feet. The design was simple, with three bedrooms and one bathroom. They had a decent-sized living room but a small kitchen. However, John made sure everything outside was in good condition and the lawn was neatly trimmed. Alma, on her part, kept things clean inside. Over the years, it was sad to see how Jenny neglected her parents, but every time I brought up the topic, it caused an argument, so I avoided mentioning John and Alma, but always kept an eye on them. I called them at least once a week, and sometimes I could get Jenny to talk to them. But beyond wanting to keep in touch, I listened to see if they needed anything. For example, one day I found out that John's lawnmower broke down and he didn't have the money to fix it. So I bought a used mower and told John I had a new one, and did he know anyone who could use my old one? I think he realized what I was doing, but he gratefully accepted the mower. Like I said, I had a well-paying job, so I was more than willing to help if needed. I started working as a staff accountant for a fairly large manufacturing company with factories in five states and two foreign countries. I worked at the headquarters of a company where the accounting department consisted of only 18 people, including myself. Despite the small size of the department, we dealt with all accounting and tax issues of all the company's enterprises. Although I was an entry-level accountant, my salary was in the high five figures. But three years after I joined the company, two events helped propel my career forward. First, John Stanton, our department manager, retired. Second, I passed the CPA exam. They initially tried to find a new manager from outside to replace John. 
but after the second one failed, I was offered this position. I was promoted to accounting supervisor, and my salary rose to the low six figures. This made Jenny very happy because we could now afford a bigger house and buy more expensive cars. Jenny became pregnant shortly after our wedding, and we had twins a girl and a boy. At first, Jenny wasn't happy to find out she was pregnant. She complained bitterly that it was too early. She wanted to travel and enjoy life at first. As for me, I was delighted. Luckily, after giving birth to twins Glenda and Mark, Jenny became a fantastic mother. And for the first five and a half years, she was a mother on maternity leave. But as soon as the children started going to kindergarten, Jenny insisted on getting a job. With a degree in English, she could only find a decent paying job as an administrative assistant at a law firm. When I found out where Jenny was going to get a job, I was concerned. I've read many stories about married women working in law firms and starting affairs with one or more lawyers. However, this did not happen. The lawyer she worked for, Clem Flint, was one of the founders of the partnership and was a 55-year-old man with a paunch. In addition, he had a wife whom he adored and five children. Mr. Paul's Flint was a devoted Christian, like his partners, and did not tolerate any pranks. Our marriage seemed very strong and our sex life was active three or four times a week. However, in the sixth year of marriage, I noticed that Jenny was not in a good mood. I confronted her once after she snapped back at Glenda for leaving a plate in the sink. What's wrong with you, Jenny? I said calmly. You shouldn't have exploded like that. It's just a plate, damn it. Jenny began to cry. It's not because of the plate. I'm just so depressed because I feel like my life is passing me by and I don't have time to live. I feel like I'm just someone's wife or mom. There are so many places I wanted to go. I'd like to get there, but I'll probably never get there. There are so many good things we can never afford. My life is crap. I was shocked by Jenny's description of our life together. I thought she was going through a midlife crisis or something and suggested she see a counselor. This proposal met with hostility. I'm not crazy, I just want a better life. With these words, Jenny left. The kids and I tried to stay away from her for several weeks. It wasn't all bad. Jenny was back to normal and we were a happy family within a few weeks. But then the dissatisfied Jenny appeared again. I was convinced that these were temporary difficulties and Jenny would eventually get better. And if not, I married her through joy and sorrow. I loved Jenny with all my heart, and I was sure that she loved me too. Plus, we had our two wonderful children, and I knew Jenny loved them. They were wonderful kids, and I spent as much time with them as I could, especially given Jenny's mood swings. I felt very sorry for the children because they did not understand. Why is mom sometimes sad and angry? So I tried to protect them from this, and always told them that no matter what their mother did, she still loved them madly. Many weekends I planned trips around the city with Mark and Glenda. Sometimes Jenny joined us, but more often she stayed at home. The children were happy when a cheerful mother was with us, but were relieved when we left a sad mother at home. The tension in our home subsided until the Independence Day picnic my company hosted every year. It was fun for all the staff, and, surprisingly, Jenny even looked forward to it. After this Independence Day picnic, things were better than usual in our house. Jenny's mood improved noticeably and our sex life took off to a new level. I couldn't be happier. But then came the New Year's Eve party at my company office when my life went to hell. Usually Jenny and I skipped the company's New Year's party. Neither of us were big drinkers and I liked dancing more than Jenny. So for both of us, New Year's was just an excuse to drink a lot of alcohol and act stupid. We usually had dinner with the kids, put them to bed, watched the ball drop, and then went to bed to ring in the new year with love. This new year was different, as Jenny said for the first time in years that she actually wanted to go. Her explanation was that we had not danced for a long time. This seemed strange to me because Jenny wasn't that good of a dancer. It all seemed strange to me, but if Jenny wanted to go to the party to dance, I was more than okay with it. And when I saw what a sexy dress she was going to wear, I had high hopes that we would have a great new year. When we arrived at the party, 
I was surprised to see our company owner, Brad Colson, there. The only company event he regularly attends was a picnic for Independence Day. In fact, it was at the last Independence Day picnic that Jenny first encountered acceptance, which he regularly attended as a 4th of July picnic. In fact, it was at the last 4th of July picnic that Jenny first met the owner of the company. I could tell everyone was a little surprised to see the boss at this particular party. Everyone agreed that he enjoyed the picnic because he enjoyed competing in volleyball and softball. He was a good athlete, but no one had the courage to tell him that he was not nearly as good as he thought. We have several guys who played baseball in college or in the minors and a woman who went to Ohio State on a full scholarship to play volleyball. Once I found Jenny, I went to get drinks for us. Before I returned, however, the music started playing and Brad asked my wife to dance. He danced three or four songs before bringing her back to our table. When I asked Jenny to dance, she said she just wanted to relax. But half an hour later, when Brad appeared, she jumped up and danced with him for five songs in a row. I finally managed to dance two dances with Jenny before she pleaded tired. About 15 minutes before midnight, Brad returned again. Jenny didn't even look in my direction when she took his hand. I was very angry to say the least, but I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of my boss. I'll talk to Jenny when we get home. I was sitting and putting out the fire when someone said it was one minute to midnight. I looked around for my wife because I wanted the new year to start with a passionate kiss from her. But I was stunned when I saw Brad pull Jenny towards him and kiss her on the lips. Anger grew inside me and I walked towards where they were still hugging. I pulled Brad away from his wife and screamed, Leave my wife alone, you idiot. The room was suddenly deathly silent as all eyes were now on us. No one had ever spoken to Mr. Kearney Carlson in such a tone. I didn't care that he was my boss. He had crossed the line and I wasn't going to stand for it. I didn't care if he fired me. My heart was racing and I knew my face was turning red. Jenny, I think it's time to go home, I said through gritted teeth. I reached for Jenny's hand, but she pulled it away. Mike, I'm sorry, Jenny said, taking Brad's hand. I'm leaving with Brad. It'll only be for one night. We'll talk tomorrow. I was so stunned that I could not utter a word. Before I could recover, Brad and Jenny were gone and everyone was looking at me. It was the most humiliating event of my life. I immediately left and went home. When I woke up on New Year's Day, I had the worst hangover of my life. Last night there was too much crying, drinking and too little sleep. I was angry at heaven and hell. I made plans for revenge against Brad Carlson. I was sure that he had tricked my wife into leaving with him. I was already preparing for what I would tell my wife when she returned home. And despite the complete disrespect, I wanted Jenny back. I loved her so much. Still, I tried my best to think of ways to really get at Brad, but the only plans that came to mind were extremely violent. And as soon as I thought of a plan, I threw it away because I didn't want to go to jail because of a bastard like Brad Colson. Three hours later, I finally managed to somehow get my giant headache under control. So I called the nanny and told her I would pick up Mark and Glenda in a couple of hours. Then reality started to sink in and I started to get paranoid. What if Jenny decides not to return? This suddenly became a real opportunity for me. What if she takes the kids first? I would be shocked. So I quickly got dressed and hurried to pick up my children before Jenny thought about it. I wanted to start any discussion with Jenny from a position of strength. The children were happy to see me, but wanted to know where mom was. I had to muster my will not to burst into tears in front of my children, so after taking a deep breath, I lied. I told them that my mother had to go on a business trip. They seemed disappointed until I asked if they wanted to go to IHOP for pancakes. While the kids ate, I started making two lists, one about how we could get through this, and the other about plans for divorce. When I got home, I was both relieved and disappointed that Jenny wasn't there. I wanted to improve my relationship with my wife, but I was afraid of what I might say or do. Then I saw the light on the answering machine flashing. The message was from Jenny, who thought that due to my emotional state, it would be better to postpone our conversation for a week. 
She explained that Brad needed a secretary on a business trip, and she agreed to fill in for him. Replacing Jenny was complete nonsense. The only one doing the filling was Brad. I crumpled up the list on how to repair a relationship and threw it in the trash. The emotional pain I was experiencing at that moment felt ten times worse than any physical pain I had ever experienced in my life. It is impossible to understand what it is unless you yourself have experienced betrayal from the person you trusted most in your life. In those days, I understood how a person could go crazy and cause horrific bodily harm to those he supposedly loved, destroy property without a second thought, and yes, even consider taking his own life. All these thoughts endlessly swirled in my brain. Finally, thankfully, I was able to put one of these thoughts aside. I will never kill myself because I love my children too much. The thought of leaving them in ruins because of my selfish act was disgusting to me. However, other dark images continued to emerge with the new addition. Were Mark and Glenda really my children? I agreed when the kids asked to play in the backyard. I needed this free time to collect my thoughts and start planning a whole new life. So while the kids played, I began expanding the list of things I needed to do to protect myself and my kids from the coming storm. The first thing on my list was a DNA test. I should have bought a set when we went out to eat. I tried to cover everything I could think of, but I knew I was probably missing a lot. So the first thing I did was call a friend who had gone through a divorce and ask if he would recommend a divorce lawyer. He said, hell no, but he definitely recommended his ex-wife's lawyer. I asked for his name and phone number. After a few minutes of searching, he gave me the information I needed. The lawyer's name was Tom Watson, and he worked in an office with three other lawyers who specialize exclusively in divorce, wills, and probate. I called this number even though it was New Year's because I thought I could leave a message and they would call me back on Tuesday. To my surprise, a man answered the phone, Tom Watson. I quickly realized that I was talking to the lawyer I wanted to hire and before he could dismiss me, I explained my problem. I think he was probably going to make an appointment with me until I mentioned that my wife's lover was Brad Colson. Then he became interested. He asked if I could come to his office at 9 a.m. on Tuesday. I said I could if I could find someone to look after my children. Please bring your children with you because they will be helpful in what I think you should do. Before you come, I want you to collect all your financial documents, including bank statements, credit cards, utility bills, and mortgage payments. I also want you to make a list of everything you and Jenny have spent over $100. Be sure to bring birth certificates, marriage certificates, social security numbers, tax returns for the years of yours, marriage, and any other documents that may be relevant. After I collected everything that might be useful, including a copy of Jenny's phone message, I spent the rest of the day playing with the kids. That evening, when we went to Pizza Joe's, I stopped by to buy a DNA test. After swabbing my children's cheeks and mine, I took the kit to the FedEx office. The DNA testing company promised results in two days. I was so relieved when the tests confirmed that the children were mine. The next morning was a bit hectic as I fed the kids and got them ready. Before leaving for the meeting, I called work and said I would take the rest of the week off. Tom Watson's office was larger than I expected, and after the introductions, Tom led us into a spacious conference room. I took Mark and Glenda to the back of the room and gave them mini iPads so they could play their educational games. Tom and I sat at the conference table on the other side of the room. I burst into tears twice while talking about how my wife went to my place for New Year's with my boss. I still couldn't believe that she had discarded me like yesterday's trash. Tom was very understanding and even compassionate. He told me that everything would work out, but I was too in a dark place to believe it. When I finished explaining my problems, Tom took out a photograph and handed it to me across the table. I want you to know something before you agree to hire me. This is a photo of my cousin Abby Colson. She was married to Joe Colson, Brad Colson's brother. Joe cheated on my cousin and then left for someone else. I represented Abby in her divorce, but lost the case because Brad paid for his brother's team of lawyers. They overwhelmed me with papers, and I was too naive to understand what was happening. 
In the end, it took me five years to partially reconsider the court's decision. That day, I tried my best to be the best family lawyer. Even though I couldn't get Abby what she deserved, my partial victory angered him. So, while I'm glad to face Mr. Kelson again, I want you to know that Brad will send his lawyers to you, especially since I represent you, but I promise that I will give my all. That's enough for me, I said firmly. Let's start. Suddenly, I felt good that I had an ally, and I finally started to fight. For the next three hours, we went through all the documentation I had brought, discussed what to expect, and finally he asked what I really wanted out of all of this. Obviously, I'd prefer none of this ever happened. But that's not possible, so I want to keep the house, half the assets, my pension intact, no alimony, and no child support. You might want to lower your expectations, Tom said grimly, but I'll fight to make sure you get it all. Do you want full custody? I shook my head, then clarified. I mean, if Jenny doesn't want kids, then I definitely want them. But I know she loves them and will probably fight for full custody. I think joint custody would be fair. Honestly, Tom said with a frown, you need to be prepared for the fact that she will most likely get primary custody. Given Mr. Kenny Colson's wealth and the likelihood that he intends to marry your wife after the divorce, she could be if you don't plan on getting married again and can't show that your wife is a maternity mom, I think the best you can get is broad visitation rights, but knowing what a jerk Colson is, they probably are, will fight against this too. This really sucks, I said with venom. I didn't do anything wrong, but I'm the one who was made a fool. As far as your children are concerned, that's probably a fair assessment. However, on the other hand, if your wife marries Brad, you won't have to pay child support. But on the other hand, you'll still have to pay alimony on children. I'll happily pay child support if I can see my kids. The last part of the meeting was Tom talking to Mark and Glenda without me in the room. I don't know what exactly they were talking about, but Tom seemed happy when he came out with the kids. You must be some kind of special father, Tom said, pulling me aside, because your children really love you. Unfortunately, they also seem to love their mother, but not as much as they love you. I left Tom Watson's office feeling better financially, but worried about how much time I would be allowed to spend with my children. Tom said he would draft a divorce and a petition to grant me temporary custody of the children. We planned to serve the claim on my wife shortly after she returned from her business trip. In the morning, Jenny called and asked to meet to talk. I agreed and arranged for the children to be elsewhere. Everything seemed to be going as Tom had predicted. I no longer had any illusions that Jenny wanted to make peace. Although it tore me apart, it was no longer possible to return to the past. Our marriage was over and Jenny chose Brad. No wonder she rang the doorbell. Tom warned me to expect something like this. However, I made her wait and ring the doorbell two more times. When I finally opened the door, it was difficult to contain my emotions. I didn't say a word, I just turned around and went back to the kitchen to get a beer. When I sat down, Jenny asked where the kids were and I almost exploded. Instead, I calmly said, so, are you interested now? I probably deserved it, she quickly tried to placate me. But I really believed that meeting right after I left you on New Year's Eve would have been very unpleasant and dangerous. I'm sorry for that. It wasn't originally planned for me to leave that night. I was going to tell you the next day, but Brad didn't want to wait. Besides, the trip happened because Brad had problems at one of the factories. He convinced me that it was better to let you cool down. And Brad was absolutely right at first, but after this trip I did. I realized that he is my soulmate. It's amazing how your soulmate turned out to be super rich. My voice dripped with sarcasm. I'm guessing you're here to talk about our divorce. So let's talk about it so you don't waste my time. I have something much more important than talking to you. I need to go to the bathroom. Anger flashed in Jenny's eyes. You don't have to be rude and offensive. I don't care what you think. Jenny was angry now. She wasn't used to being talked to like that. I don't have to sit here and take insults. Then leave, I said, 
standing up and heading into the garden. I didn't really want Jenny to leave. However, given my condition, this might have been better. But it seems that my reaction confused her, and she lost her enthusiasm. No, I think we need to end this conversation. Then she fumbled awkwardly in her bag and pulled out an envelope, handing it across the table to me. I opened it and started reading. Again, Tom was absolutely right. The terms Jenny offered were quite generous until I read the last paragraph. At that moment, I almost threw myself across the table to rip Jenny's throat out. I threw the papers in her face. Tell Brad Colson to shove this proposal up his ass. I will never agree to him adopting my children, and offering me $100,000 to agree is simply despicable. Mike, Brad and I can offer kids a much better life than you can. Fuck you, Jenny, and your shitty soulmate. Mike, this will be better for the children, she began, ignoring my insults. I'll be a stay-at-home mom, and they'll be able to go to better schools. They'll live in a better house, and they'll be able to travel. These are all things you can't offer them. But if it helps, Brad is willing to pay you $250,000 to help you. Approved the adoption. Jenny, not only are you a complete bitch, but you're also an idiot. What part of screw you and your soulmate didn't you understand? I'm sure Brad will raise his offer to $500,000, Jenny said quickly. That's probably more money than you'll ever have at one time. We were barely making ends meet with your salary. And remember, Brad is your employer and your job could be gone overnight. Even if he offers $100 million, I won't agree. I was on the verge of a breakdown and had to calm down. I glanced at my watch, then turned my attention back to Jenny. I've had time to reflect on our marriage, and what I've realized is not pretty. You may think that you are golden, but that's not true. We had a pretty good marriage for a while, but for the last year you've been a lousy wife, a lousy mother, and an overall lousy person. And we made ends meet, but you always spent way more than you had to, because you always wanted the best. I don't need Brad's crumbs. And if Brad is going to fire me, I'm going to have to go to the EOC. Now the court has granted me temporary custody of the children due to your care. I didn't abandon my children, she retorted angrily. Then the front doorbell rang. This is for you, I said with a smile, heading towards the door. I opened the door and saw a deputy sheriff. I stepped aside so he could see Jenny standing a little behind me. He nodded and asked, Are you Jenny Wilson? After she showed him her driver's license, he handed me an envelope and informed her that she had been officially notified. I grinned as she read the divorce suit and then ran away crying. God, how good it was. She just left and was given a notice, I told Tom on his cell phone. You behaved yourself, I hope, Tom asked. It was difficult, but I held it in. However, Jenny left here in tears after the presentation, I admitted. I don't know what it is. You were absolutely right about what they would suggest. However, they included one unexpected element that almost made me snap. It turns out that Brad Colson wants to adopt my children. He can't do it, right? It's an unexpected situation, Tom admitted. As for terminating your parental rights, it will be extremely difficult unless they can prove that you are completely unfit as a parent. So you will have to be extremely careful in how you behave towards your wife and Brad. Also try to be around other people who can be your witnesses if necessary. I wouldn't be surprised if that scoundrel Brad made up some story and made his witnesses swear to it. I know you're a good father, but just remember that they can. Try to twist even the most innocent events to make you look worse. Now that I know their plan, we will prepare. Tom, will this ever get easier? I asked as the pain of Jenny leaving hit me again. Yes, it will. Tom answered immediately. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll admit that you don't feel as destroyed today as you did the night your wife left. However, there will be good days and bad days for a long time to come. And I want to warn you that we'll probably lose some fights with Brad and Jenny as we go along. But every time we lose, we'll pick ourselves up and find new ways to fight. Like they said in the 60s, keep the faith, buddy. During the week I took off, I did all the financial preparation that Tom advised. 
I opened new accounts in my name and transferred half of all our funds to them. I started an after-school program for twins. Their school offered a program where children could stay until 5.30 in the evening. This was ideal since I worked from 7 in the morning until 3.30 in the afternoon. This gave me enough time to get home, get some errands done, and still pick up the kids on time. The week also gave me time to work out a schedule with the kids. Jenny ran the house pretty freely, especially when it came to bedtime. However, I would need to set a stricter routine if it was going to work for me. I bathed them, brushed their teeth, and put them to bed by 8 o'clock in the evening. At first they objected, but when I promised to read two stories instead of one, they began to look forward to bedtime. Spending time with my children saved me. We became even closer, and surprisingly, they didn't ask about mom so often. But one day Mark asked if mom would ever return. I didn't want to hurt my children, but I didn't want to lie to them either. I told them the whole truth. Their mother found a new man who she likes better than me and wants to live with him. In fact, she wanted him to be their new dad. Both kids started crying, and then I felt terrible. I may have said too much, so I quickly convinced them that no matter what, I would always be their dad. This calmed them down and earned me two big hugs. When Saturday morning arrived, it was time to take the kids to riding lessons. Although their mother had not seen them for over a week, Mark and Glenda were delighted because they were going to see Miss Darla. Riding lessons were my idea, which Jenny did not support. Like many little girls, Glenda loved horses and wanted to learn to ride. Mark went along with the company because he didn't want to be left out. However, he quickly became a much better rider than his sister. Darla Lamson owned a stable that also offered riding lessons. She was an excellent riding instructor, and the children adored her. She had a sweet face, although she was 10 or 15 pounds overweight, but she had a warm smile and an infectious laugh. I liked her from the first meeting. Jenny made fun of me and told me that I liked Darla because she laughed at all my stupid jokes, which was true. However, Darl was easy to love. Where is Mrs. Wilson? Darla asked as I stood at the playpen fence. Mrs. Wilson and I are getting a divorce, I said without emotion. I'm sorry, Darla said quickly. I didn't mean to get involved. No, it's okay, I said to calm her down. So be it. I just hope we can continue riding with the kids. I have kids now, but my lawyer says the court will probably give her primary custody and I'll only have visitation rights. I'll fight for joint custody, but things aren't looking good. Why is this so? Well, after the divorce is finalized, Jenny will marry her rich lover. Then she can stay home with the kids, and I'll have to hire nannies. And the horror is that I work for this married shit Brad. So as bad as it already is, I expect I'll soon be out of a job when he starts pushing me. Isn't that Brad Calson? Darla asked, narrowing her eyes. Yes, do you know him? I never met him personally, but I had to deal with his lawyers. His property borders on a ranch, and he wanted two acres of my land and didn't want to pay for it. And all he wanted with that land was to create a buffer between his property and mine. The only thing he did was plant dozens of trees and bushes. Heck, if he asked me, I would do it. But Mr. Gillies Colson doesn't believe in asking, whatever he wants. In any case, his lawyers filed one petition after another, and I didn't have enough money to fight him. Besides, the land was basically a swamp, and after five months of litigation, I thought. I was wasting money fighting for land I wasn't using. I ended up agreeing that if he would pay my lawyer, I'd sign the two acres over to him. My property taxes went down a bit, though. The experience left me with a bad taste towards Brad Colson. I hope I'll be there when he gets what he deserves. Yes, I agree with you. Brad is a real bastard. But my soon-to-be ex-wife chose him to pin her star on him. And I, too, would like to be there when not only Brad, but also my wife, get what they deserve, I said, hoping Brad would leave her sooner rather than later. What are you going to do if Mr. Cowson fires you? Darla asked. I have already started a new career. I am an accountant, but I work for Mr. Gaddis Colson's company. I have always done taxes and accounting on the side for extra income. 
I recently expanded this and found three small businesses that want me to do their bookkeeping and taxes. It's not enough to survive yet, but I'm saving whatever money I can from my day job and my side business to help me when I quit. I'm working from home now, but I'm sure I'll have to sell it. After the divorce is completed, I will then have to look for an apartment, which is not suitable for developing a business. If you can do my bookkeeping for the same amount I'm paying now, Darla said softly, I'd be happy to trust you with my business. I can't ask you to do that, I protested. If your accountant is doing a good job, there's no reason to change. I don't even know if they're doing a good job, Darla laughed. They were the accountants for the ranch when my father died and left it to me. They do my payroll, quarterly and annual taxes, and I pay them $2,000 a month, plus about $5,500 for my federal taxes. I don't know anyone at the firm. And one time when I had a question, it took them several weeks to answer me. I quickly glanced at Glenda and Mark and saw them happily jumping on their horses across the foot-high runway with their instructor running alongside. Then I turned back to Darla. Okay, if you're sure, I'll take a quick look at your books right now. If I can do the job for the same amount, I'll add you to my huge list of clients. Darla laughed and led me into her office. She then pulled out the current books, which were kept by hand, and last year's federal tax return. I quickly determined that what Minter, Smith, and Zeller were charging was outrageous. I can't do this for the amount they charge, I told Darla with a grin. I could not in good conscience charge you more than $750 a month and $2,000 for federal tax returns. No, Darla objected. I'm willing to pay you the same amount. No, I don't work that way. In my opinion, your current accountants are ripping you off. You're probably too small a client for them, and they won't care if you leave. I'll only take you on as a client if I can charge you a fair fee. Wow, I didn't expect that, Darla said gratefully. This will really help me. It hasn't been easy since I took over the ranch three years ago. Saving $1.250 a month really means a lot. Thank you. Oh yeah, and it goes without saying what a lesson Glenda and Mark have been with. Then you won't have to pay. I can't ask you to do that, I protested in vain. You didn't ask, Darla smiled. I'll tell you. Getting Darla's ranch as a client was a big help, but the divorce was just starting to pick up steam. It will be a long and unpleasant journey. Also, even though Tom said it would get better over time, it didn't. It seemed like every week a photo of Brad and Jenny was published in the social section of the newspaper. It was so unfair that Jenny's life seemed perfect while mine was in shambles. And on top of all this was the frustrating inability to figure out a way to get back at them. I was lonely and unhappy. My day started out great when I received a call from Harvey's Hardware asking me to do their bookkeeping. But after that the day went downhill. When I arrived at work, I was informed that I was fired. I was not surprised, and in part I was even relieved. Ever since the New Year's Eve party happened, things have been extremely awkward. Although no one said anything to my face, conversations suddenly stopped when I entered the room. Still, the job loss was depressing. Brad was still pulling all the strings. Tom has already prepared documents to file with the EOC in a wrongful termination case. However, he warned me that it would be a long and difficult struggle that could take years. But Tom sent out a press release about my fight with Brad, which I heard pissed my ex-boss to death. The day got even worse when Tom called me a few hours later to tell me that the judge had signed an order granting Jenny joint custody starting that evening. I was devastated until Tom explained that it wasn't that bad. The children would stay in the house, but Jenny could live there too. Realizing how inconvenient this would be, she chose not to exercise this right. Instead, she had to pick up the kids every day after school, and I had to pick them up in the evening. It was a nightmare for me as I had to see Jenny and Brad every evening when I picked up Glenda and Mark. And Jenny used to make sure I saw how happy she was. She would hug Brad, kiss him, or say something loving. This left me completely depressed, and the kids completely confused. I didn't think things could get any worse, but I was wrong. Once Jenny was awarded joint custody, 
her lawyers began filing motions to change the children's primary residence to Brad's home. The basis for their appeal was that I allegedly denied Jenny visits. They also claimed that I was trying to turn the children away from her. Upon learning of this, Tom immediately filed a complaint in court, stating that I never denied Jenny the right to see the children. Moreover, he suggested that the judge personally interview the children, since they spoke with their mother almost every evening. One of the questions that the children always asked was, When are you coming to visit us, Mom? Fortunately, the judge ruled that the children will remain where they are for now. However, he said nothing about the charges against me. This bothered Tom because he felt that the judge was not paying enough attention to this divorce case. But as he noted, to be fair, the judge was considering 30 or 40 cases at the same time. Then the judge changed his order, ordering us to take turns babysitting for two weeks at a time. In his infinite wisdom, he decided that the children would move back and forth between our homes. At first I thought this would be extremely inconvenient for Jenny since the kids' school was 35 minutes away from Brad's house. But I didn't take into account how cunning Jenny and Brad could be. But I soon found out. I should have known from the moment Jenny walked out on me at Brad's New Year's party that I never really knew this woman. In fact, I don't think Jenny really knew herself. However, it's hard to let go when you love someone so desperately. However, when Jenny took Glenda and Mark the first time, what my soon-to-be ex-wife said left me in shock. Jenny seemed nervous but determined. As soon as she put the children in the car and they drove away, she turned to me. Please don't complicate the divorce. I still care about you and I don't want Brad to destroy you. If you let Brad adopt the children, I will give you full dating rights but I want you to understand that I won't let you destroy my relationship with Brad. Wow, I shook my head, and I thought you were just a cheater, but I was wrong. You're also a conniving bastard. You would have given me full dating rights, but no way. To hell with you. I turned and walked back into the house, but over my shoulder I heard her say, You have been warned. I called Tom immediately after Jenny left and told him about her words. Tom wasn't surprised. I told you to expect the worst from Brad. Have you installed cameras in the house yet? The exterior cameras will be installed tomorrow. But for now, I have one in my bedroom, one in the kids' bedroom, and one in the hallway leading to the bathroom. I also put one in the living room and in the kitchen. Tomorrow, they will install cameras to monitor the front and backyard. That's all we can do now, Tom seemed pleased. But remember that Brad's lawyers will probably start making accusations of mistreatment of you. The cameras should refute any accusations. The days that Mark and Glenda were with Jenny were difficult. Brad led a very active social life. He and Jenny often appeared in the social section of newspapers, or I saw them on TV. Often the children would be with them if it was a daytime event. In all the photos I saw, Jenny was beaming, and the kids seemed excited and happy wherever they were. Each of these images crushed my soul even more. I couldn't compete with Brad's money. It seemed to me that he was gradually taking my children away from me. On the Monday of the eighth week after D-Day, the real test began. Around nine o'clock in the morning, I received a call from the children's school informing me that Mark and Glenda were missing. I called Jenny immediately. Are the children sick? I asked with great concern. No, why do you think so? Jenny answered calmly. The school called and said they weren't there. Oh, that, Jenny said disdainfully. I transferred them to Chesterton School. It's a much better school, and it's only five minutes from my house. You can't do that, I exploded. I can, and I did, she replied sharply and hung up. My desperate call to Tom changed nothing. He explained that we would fight the transfer, but the judge would probably allow it since the new school had a much higher rating. Courts, I have learned, always try to do what they think is best for children, even if it sends an absolutely terrible message to children. In this case, the message was that their mother could do whatever she wanted and their father was powerless to change anything. Sinking into depression, Tom warned me that the worst was yet to come. He urged me to be extremely vigilant because he felt this was just the opening salvo from Brad and Jenny. 
he was absolutely right, and I thank God that Tom insisted on installing security cameras and transmitting images to security and the cloud. Tom filed a complaint against the school change on Tuesday. The hearing was not scheduled until three weeks later. But on Wednesday of the same week, Jenny's lawyers filed a complaint accusing me of molesting our daughter. I was furious, and it took all of Tom's skill to keep me from physically attacking Brad and Jenny. However, two things happened, but I thought only one of them ended well for me. An emergency hearing was scheduled, but I was banned from seeing the children until an investigation was conducted. I was not even allowed to observe meetings as there was talk of possible criminal prosecution. Tom immediately obtained a bench warrant to learn the details of the charges. He wanted Jenny to state when the alleged harassment occurred, where it happened, and what exactly happened. Jenny's lawyers initially objected, arguing that it would traumatize the children. Fortunately for me, the judge did not accept their arguments. He had seen this trick too many times. Let's be absolutely clear, Mr. Silas. The judge looked at Jenny's lawyer with an iron gaze. I take these charges very seriously. If they are proven, I will you'll make sure that Mr. Buter Wilson will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, and he will not see his children until they are 18 years old. However, if I find out that your client is trying to manipulate me, it will reflect badly on Mrs. Wilson. I expect you to provide Mr. Kirge Watson with a detailed description of when, where, and what occurred in this alleged harassment. Is that clear, Mr. Silas? Lawyer Jenny a little turned pale and nodded. I also noticed that the smile on his face Jenny suddenly disappeared. The next day Mr. Pamsilis emailed a list of dates, times and places of alleged molestation. He did not provide any description of what form of molestation took place. I was furious that they were still playing games and trying to ruin my life. But Tom assured me that we have enough funds to fully refute their claims. There were six of them, all in the evening, in the bathroom and nursery bedroom. Tom immediately had a security company review the video for all footage of the bathing and bedroom scenes. The camera in the hallway clearly showed the twins taking their baths one after the other every night and me handing them a towel as they came out of the bath. In the bedroom, it was clear that I would lay out their pajamas for them and they would put them on. I would then read two stories before laying them down, hugging each one and kissing the top of their heads. There was absolutely nothing inappropriate. The emergency hearing began with the judge's harsh and harsh condemnation of anyone who sexually abused a child. Okay, Mr. Silas, you've made this disgusting accusation, so what evidence do you have? The children told their mother, the lawyer replied, and given the gravity of the situation, we immediately stepped in to protect them. Mr. Benham Watson, the judge turned to Tom, what does your client say about this? Your Honor, both my client and I declare that the allegation is completely false, and when we prove it, we ask the court to impose sanctions against Mrs. Powell Watson. If your honor permits, I would like to play the episode video courtesy of Able Security. At my suggestion, Mr. Praz Wilson installed cameras inside and outside his home because I was afraid of such an outrageous accusation being made. Mr. Silas immediately rose to his feet. Your honor, this is highly irregular and questionable at best. How do we know these videos aren't doctored? The judge sighed in irritation. Obviously, Mr. Disifusilis, you are not familiar with the security system that Mr. Bowie Wilson has installed in his home. The video footage from Mr. Wilson's home is directly streamed to Able Security. From there, it is stored on the company's server for one year. If I remember correctly, the video is also stored in the cloud. The video can only be accessed from the servers or the cloud using the access codes of two company officers. This is a reliable system, and I trust it. When the video footage was reviewed, the judge clearly saw that nothing happened during the time periods specified by Jenny. The judge was unhappy. He ordered the children who were waiting in the corridor to be brought to their chambers. After a 20-minute conversation with the children, the judge and my children left. They were sent back into the hallway to wait with the nanny Jenny had brought with her. After talking to the kids, I decided to let it go as a misunderstanding. 
Glenda admitted that she told her mom that dad touched them. But when I asked her to explain, she said that he hugged them in the morning, kissed them, and hugged them before school. Again, when they were returning from school and before going to bed. Although I think Mrs. Windsor Wilson should have done some further investigation, this time I will let it go as a misunderstanding. But be warned, Mrs. Wilson, if it happens again, I will not take kindly to it. Your Honor, Mr. De Toad Silas stood up. Since we're here, perhaps you can work out the issue of changing schools. Yes, that would be appropriate, the judge said slowly. After looking at both schools, I agree with Mrs. Wilson that Chesterton Elementary is better, and I asked the kids about it, and they said they liked the school. I avoided jail time, but lost a major battle, and the loss was even worse than I initially thought. Mike, I'll be honest with you, the judge's decision was a bad one. It all but guarantees that Jenny will get primary custody of Glenda and Mark. However, two good things came out of this hearing. One of them is that you won't go to jail and you won't be separated from your children. And secondly, since they couldn't accuse you of molesting children, you will at least get the right to see your children. Yes, I know how it works, I said, feeling my anger rising. Jenny will come up with ways to screw up my visits. We'll complain, the court will tell Jenny not to do it, and these two cheaters will come up with a new way to screw me up. Isn't there anything I can do to counteract what they're doing? Tom shook his head slowly. Short of moving to the Chesterton School District and getting married, I don't see how the judge could have done anything differently. I had the kids that Saturday and took them to riding lessons. I usually enjoyed watching them ride and sometimes chatting with Darla. Today, I was as depressed as a person could be. My life was a mess. Not only did my wife leave me and I lost my job, but as far as I could see, her life was perfect while mine turned to crap, and she was going to take my children from me. It was so unfair. She cheated, and I'm punished. Hey, Mike, Darla sat down next to me on the bench. You look really depressed. Things can't be that bad, right? I explained to Darla that after my divorce from Jenny was final, the children would probably no longer come to class. I told her that in order to get joint custody, I would have to move to the Chesterton School District and get married. I had no prospects for marriage and no opportunity to move to Marion County. No offense, Mike, but your wife is a real bitch, Darla said. She's treated me like dirt ever since she first enrolled your kids. When she came and started picking on me, I was going to tell her to get her ass to hell. But then I saw the look on Glenda's face and I couldn't do it. I smiled sadly. No offense, I completely agree with you. We were silent for a few minutes, and then Darla straightened up. Hey, I have an idea. My house and half of this property are in Marion County and the Chesterton School District. Why don't you move here, and we'll tell everyone we're married? Then you'll have an equal chance with your wife. I looked at Darla for a few minutes with a funny expression on my face, but then I started thinking about her offer. The more I thought, the more I liked it, so I asked Darla to accompany me to my next meeting with Tom to explain the plan. He immediately rejected the idea. Mike, I know you're desperate, but a fake marriage won't work. You'll have to provide a marriage certificate, and when they realize you're deceiving them, they can give Jenny full custody of the kids. I was deeply disappointed, but Darla did not lose heart. What if we actually get married? What? We can't do this, I said immediately. Listen to me, Darla demanded. Let's say we get engaged, and once your divorce is finalized, we get married at City Hall. In the meantime, you can move in with me. I have three bedrooms, so I'll sleep in mine, and you'll sleep in one of the others. There's even an office at the entrance. You could run your accounting business from there. You could pay me a nominal rent and sell your house. What do you think? Tom looked from Darla to me and then back to Darla. I was encouraged that he didn't immediately say no. However, he had concerns. Okay, on the face of it, what you are proposing is not necessarily illegal. However, you will have to have an actual wedding ceremony. There are other things to consider as well. We will need to formalize an agreement to clearly state Mike's financial contributions to the house. 
I insist on a prenuptial agreement that will specify what assets each of you will keep if you decide to separate. And if you divorce in less than a year, I think Brad and Jenny could argue that it was a sham marriage, at least 18 months. I agree to all of this, Darla said immediately. My head was spinning, and I wasn't sure if this was the right decision. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure. Darla, this is a huge intrusion into your life. Anything I can do to stand up to Brad, I'm willing to do it, she said with a smile. After we signed all the paperwork that Tom had prepared, Darla seemed absolutely happy with the entire process. I thought she must hate Brad as much as I do. The gist of everything we agreed to was that we would be married for at least 18 months and could divorce at any time after that. The division of property was clearly agreed upon, so that everyone kept what they had before marriage and what they had earned for 18 months. I paid rent to live in Darla's house, but it was stated in the prenuptial agreement as my share of the costs of maintaining the house. The next day Darla and I went to court and filed for marriage. We took blood tests and then waited for the final decision on divorce. Tom filed for shared custody of the children, while Jenny's lawyer filed for full custody. While Darla and I kept our marriage plans a secret, Jenny and Brad trumpeted their plans in every possible way. Photos with details of their wedding appeared in the social section of newspapers. More than 500 people were expected to attend the wedding. Of course, I was not among them. On the day of the final hearing, I had a knot in my stomach the size of a softball. Even though I felt that I now had an equal chance with Jenny and Brad, I knew enough about the court system to understand that fairness and justice were often not part of their final decision. Jenny's lawyer, Mr. Dursi Silas, began by detailing my shortcomings. Mr. Pulterberg Wilson is currently unemployed and having difficulty paying bills. He does not live in the Chesterton School District where Glenda and Mark Wilson now attend. Additionally, we are still concerned about Mr. Busey Wilson's state of mind. Objection. Tom jumped to his feet. The judge fixed his eyes on Mr. Bayou Silas and waved for Tom to sit down. Mr. Silas, do you have evidence that Mr. Wilson's state of mind poses a danger to children? Not specifically, Your Honor, Mr. Silas replied ruefully. Then don't go into it, the judge answered sharply. In conclusion, Mr. Terer Silas continued smoothly. Jenny Wilson and Brad Cowson plan to marry shortly after Mrs. Wilson's divorce is finalized. Mr. Coase Cowson's home is in the Chesterton School District, and he has significant assets. Mrs. Wee Wilson will be a stay-at-home mom. We therefore believe that granting full custody to Mrs. Suete Wilson will be in the best interests of the children. After Mr. Silas returned to his seat, Tom stood up. I would like to correct some of the incorrect information that Mr. Silas has presented at this hearing. First, Mr. Pease Wilson does not have any difficulty paying his bills. I present his financial statements to prove that Mr. Wilson has sufficient funds to pay his bills and child support. However, if Mr. Wilson had financial difficulties, it would be because Mr. Coulson illegally fired him. We sued Mr. Coulson's parent company with a complaint to the EOC. We expect a very favorable settlement as, once the business is completed. Also, Mr. Bonas Wilson has started his own accounting firm. I have included the financial statements for the business, and you will see that it is profitable and growing. Also, Mr. Prezer Wilson is engaged to Darla Lampson and now lives in her home in the Chesterton School District. They plan to get married as soon as the divorce is finalized. Therefore, we respectfully request that Mr. Brown Wilson be appointed as either the primary guardian or at least the joint guardian. While Tom was sitting down, I looked to see where Jenny was sitting. She had a stunned look on her face, Brad's face was red with anger, and Mr. Silas's face was filled with displeasure. It gave me the best feeling I've had in weeks. We clearly caught them by surprise. I'd like to talk to the kids a little before I make a decision, the judge said, nodding to the bailiff. The knot in my stomach had doubled in size and was now beginning to turn over. The judge talked to the children for about 20 minutes, and when they came out they looked confused and unsure. But then they saw me and waved. 
I smiled and waved back, which made them both smile. They stopped and hugged their mother before leaving the courtroom, making a decision about which parent to give custody of their children when both parents love their children is the hardest part of my job, the judge began. It is extremely painful when I have to give custody to one parent instead of another. However, ultimately I must do what is in the best interests of the children. The judge fell silent for a moment and pulled out a piece of paper from the folder. I looked across the room and saw a smile on the faces of Jenny, Brad, and Mr. Silas. My heart sank to my stomach. She will win again. Like I said, I have to do what's best for the kids, the judge began again. In this case, I had to consider that both parents could provide the necessities for the children, allow the children to go to the same school, and have the same family status. The deciding factor was what the children wanted, and after talking with them, I learned that they want to spend time with both parents. Therefore, I am granting joint custody to Glenda and Mark Wilson. The children will spend two weeks with each parent, and since Mrs. Weiss Wilson is already with the children, she will be with them first. This Sunday, Mr. Boisha Wilson will pick up the children. Since the parents' homes are only five or ten minutes away from each other, this will not be a difficulty for either parent. The transfer will take place no later than two o'clock every Sunday. Any other questions? When no one said a word, the judge announced that the divorce would be final in 30 days and slammed his gavel. An agreement on the division of property has already been reached with a division of only 5050 and the house was put up for sale and was expected to sell pretty quickly. After all expenses, Jenny and I will each end up with about $1.60. For Jenny it was pennies, but it gave me a little extra money in case of need. I was beyond happy, but I wanted to pretend that this was the expected outcome. I hugged the children in the hallway. I then walked over to where Jenny and Brad were berating Mr. T. Silas about the judge's decision. Mr. T. Silas tried, although without much success, to explain that there was nothing he could do. Sorry, Jenny, I said with a grin. I'm sorry to interrupt your conversation, but I would like to clarify when I can pick up the children in two weeks on Sunday. That's not going to happen, asshole, Brad snorted. Whatever, Brad, I replied with contempt. I just want to know when I can pick up the kids. I don't want to be accused of trespassing. If it's more convenient for you, we can meet at a neutral location, like McDonald's. The judge said at 2 p.m. asshole, and that's how it's going to stay until our lawyers look at it. Jenny snapped. You really hit rock bottom. I mean marry Miss Piggy to get joint custody. That last comment was completely inappropriate, and it made me angry. So I perked up. You're the last one who should talk. You're marrying your grandfather. You little bastard, shouted Brad. Come outside and I will turn you into asphalt. I had no intention of fighting Brad. He was three inches taller and about 30 pounds heavier. Still, I was angry about everything, so I continued. Don't you need to go to the car to get your cane first? Brad rushed at me, but I jumped out of the way. Jenny probably realized how this was going to end because she grabbed Brad's arm. At the same time, Mr. Silas came between us. Mr. Cars Carlson, please, he begged. If you attack Mr. Cuffer Wilson, the court may grant him sole custody of the children. Please, Brad, Jenny begged. Suddenly I realized that my two children were clinging to my leg and screaming at Brad. Don't hurt our dad. Jenny glanced at me but then turned her attention to the children. It's okay, kids. Mr. Koss Carlson and Dad were just joking. Let's go get some ice cream. As they were leaving, I shouted to Jenny, I'll be there at two o'clock in two weeks on Sunday. Jenny just stared at me, but I didn't say or do anything else. I picked up the kids at the appointed time, and we went to the movies and had dinner with Miss Darla. Brad's lawyers were unable to change anything. The kids were thrilled that I was living on the ranch with Miss Darla. They rode horses all the time and loved Darla's cooking. When Jenny and I were married, I did most of the cooking. Jenny barely knew how to boil water. Thirty days after the judge's decision, Darla and I were married in court, the children present. 
Darla's best friend was a witness for her, and Tom was a witness for me. After the ceremony, I gave Darla a little kiss on the lips. The expression on her face was full of joy. A week after our wedding, Jenny and Brad's wedding was all over the public pages of the newspaper. Jenny looked as happy as could be. However, the happiness on my children's faces hurt my heart deeply. It wasn't fair. But as the weeks turned into months, it seemed like Tom's prediction that the pain would eventually go away would never come true. Although there were days when the pain was not so acute, my nights were full of loneliness and suffering. For the first six months, I kept trying to figure out a way to get revenge. But no matter how hard I try, I couldn't think of anything that wouldn't land me in jail. How could I harm a man whose net worth is estimated at several hundred million dollars? And what could I do with Jenny, tell her parents? They already knew, and Jenny didn't care. However, it was very painful because every photo I saw in the newspaper had a happy woman in it. She married higher and left me. In my darkest moments, I entertained the idea of poisoning my children's minds against their mother. But I loved them too much to do something like that. My pain remained acute, and what made the pain worse was that my kids seemed happy with a new device, and I couldn't blame them because, frankly, they had the best of both worlds. They were able to see their mother and father regularly. My kids raved about how wonderful Brad had everything set up. They admired Brad's pool, hot tub, game room, tennis court, and large TVS in every room. He even had a mini movie room with a popcorn machine. About three months after the divorce was final, Jenny began trying to manipulate Glenda and Mark against me. Jenny started implying that I was a bad father because I didn't spend as much money on them as Brad did. When they told me about this, I was filled with sadness and anger. When Darla found out about this, she was furious. She insisted that we sit down with the children and talk to them. So the next time they came back to stay with me for two weeks, I sat them down at the kitchen table and asked, Do you guys think I'm a bad dad because I don't spend as much money on you as Brad and Mom? That's what Mom says, Mark answered hesitantly. Mark, son, Mr. Basin Carlson is a very, very rich man. That's why your mother decided to marry him. I can't buy you everything they can. You see, compared to Mr. Ba Carlson, I'm a very poor man. That's it. What I can do is love you guys and tell you that if getting all these gifts is important to you, I won't force you to come to the ranch. Glenda began to cry. No, Dad, I don't want to be with Mom all the time. I want to be with you too. Me too, Mark said, tears welling in his eyes. I don't know what the kids said to Jenny when they returned to her, but it made her angry and she came to the ranch in a rage. Damn it, Mark and Glenda are mad at me for teasing their poor daddy. It exploded when I opened the door. I wasn't going to get into an argument with her, so I just said, fuck off, Jenny. Then I slammed the door in her face. This was just the beginning. Jenny then began planning special trips for the children during my fortnight. The first was a trip to Disneyland. Of course they wanted to go and begged me until I gave up. Jenny started doing this every three months, and it really started to frustrate me. Darla told me how to outsmart Jenny. The next time they came to me wanting to go to New York, I said that's fine, we'll just switch weeks. When Jenny refused, the kids were upset with her, not with me. Points for the good guys. It was a truly stressful and depressing time in my life. Luckily for me, I had a lot of support. Darla was always there to support me when I started to crumble. But I also had two other allies, John and Alma Smith. Yes, Jenny's parents became my strong allies. When Jenny married Brad, she didn't even invite her parents to the wedding. She was ashamed of them and didn't want them to ruin her special day. When I found out about this, I invited them to the ranch for a barbecue that same day. Darla insisted that John and Alma stay the weekend. We had a great time with them, and I learned that John was a soldier in Vietnam. He was wounded three times, but survived the war. He returned home partially disabled, which limited his ability to work. It wasn't that he couldn't work, but his employers looked at his three missing fingers and the scars on his face and decided he would be a liability. I was amazed when Alma told me that he had been awarded three Purple Hearts, 
a bronze star, and a silver star. The man was a real hero, and Jenny was ashamed of him. I think at that point my feelings for Jenny started to fade. From then on, we usually invited them over for at least one weekend when the children were with me. Jenny refused to invite her parents to her home or visit them. I was incredibly upset by the way Jenny treated her parents. At least Mark and Glenda got to know their grandparents through their visits to the ranch. And one more thing I learned, John grew up on a cattle ranch. He was a real cowboy before Vietnam. And John even convinced me to start learning to ride. This opened up a whole new world of interaction with my children. As the months went by, I read a lot of books about divorce and co-parenting. One piece of advice that was very valuable suggested that instead of buying things for children, give them experiences. And Darla was fantastic at coming up with entertainment ideas. We visited all the local attractions, went hiking, bowling, and even played mini golf a few times. Darla also partnered with a local charity league to organize a mini rodeo. To make it even more fun for the kids, she involved them in the planning. Glenda and Mark were very excited to see their first rodeo, especially when they learned they would be leading the parade through town. However, Jenny tried to sabotage the rodeo by suggesting that the children go to Disneyland in California. But Mark and Glenda refused their mother's offer. There was no chance they would miss their first rodeo, and it was so successful that it has since become an annual event. In the first year after the divorce, Jenny continued to try to win the love of her children. She never stopped throwing stones in my garden. Sometimes she would convince the kids to skip a few days with me for something with her and Brad. However, no matter how bad I felt every time the kids chose to spend extra time with their mother instead of me, I never let them know it. And every night when they were with me, I continued to read them two books before bed. Of course, as I grew older, I started reading chapters from books, and I read several chapters every night. I continued to do this until the fifth grade. Although we didn't sleep together, life with Darla was very pleasant. She was cheerful and kind, and working from her office, I was able to expand my accounting business. By the end of the first year, my salary was about 70% of what it was when I worked for Brad. However, even a year after the divorce, Jenny was still trying to outdo me in the eyes of the children. However, Brad now realized that I would never allow him to adopt my children. Realizing this, he began to lose interest in them. He was still kind and pleasant to them, but they were just someone else's children. Brad began to devote more and more time to Jenny. Brad wanted Jenny to accompany him on trips abroad. If it was her two weeks with the children, they traveled with them. At first I was against Glenda and Mark going abroad. I have heard many horror stories about spouses kidnapping children and flying to a country without an extradition treaty. However, Darla convinced me that even though Brad was a scoundrel, the scandal surrounding the kidnapping of my children would cost him too much. In the end, I agreed. Glenda and Mark were delighted with the trip and talked about it for a long time. Several more trips abroad followed with their mother. One time Brad's trip was extended, I was sure Jenny would just leave the kids with her. But instead she called me and sent the children home on a plane where I met them. The first anniversary of my divorce passed without me even realizing it. Until the day Tom called me to see how I was doing, I didn't even remember it. At that moment I had to admit to Tom that he was right. Almost all the pain, loneliness and anger were gone. Sometimes there was a slight burning sensation, but mostly Jenny was just a bad memory for me. However, I felt guilty for not getting Darla anything for our anniversary. I realized it wasn't a real marriage, but Darla was so supportive that I bought her flowers and took her out to dinner. I didn't think much of it, but Darla glowed with happiness for days afterward. However, as the 18-month mark approached, Darla began to seem depressed. She was never unpleasant, but I could tell she was upset. I thought my welcome had worn out, so I started looking for a new place to live. Although custody no longer seemed like a big deal, I didn't want to take the risk. I looked everywhere until I found a townhouse for rent. It had three bedrooms and two bathrooms. There was also a one-car garage but most importantly, it was located in the Chesterton School District. I really didn't want to move. 
I loved living on a ranch and running a business from my office was ideal. Plus, I liked the company Dolly. Before over the last few weeks, she has always been cheerful and cheerful. With some advice from me, Darla expanded the ranch. She acquired an additional 200 acres of mostly rocky hills. The trails on these hills especially appealed to people who didn't want to just ride around in the paddock, and it was a great place for groups to get away for the weekend to ride, sleep, and cook outdoors. It was a favorite place for corporations to spend their weekends for team building. Then I convinced Darla to start offering summer camps for children. They became extremely popular and Darla had to hire additional people to run them. Darla then built a dozen cabins for adults who wanted the experience of working on a real horse ranch. I helped arrange funding for this project. From a business that barely supported Darla's living, she now had a business that brought her nearly $200,000 a year after taxes. My business grew to the point where I was using an office and a back room. I had an administrator secretary and one accountant working for me. My income was about 70% more than what I was making working for Brad. I forgot about it, but Brad's company finally agreed to settle a wrongful termination claim. Tom thought I should hold out a little longer, but I wanted to get it over with. They paid me $250,000. Although Tom was entitled to a third, I gave him half. I saved the other half to buy a new home and open an office. On the eve of the 18th month, I announced my intentions while the children were with their mother. Darla, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I began as sadness overwhelmed me. You saved me when I thought I was going to lose Mark and Glenda. I know it was a huge challenge, but for me it was a lifesaver. Our agreement ends tomorrow, so I found a place to rent temporarily until I can buy a house, and I'm hoping that everything will be okay if I continue to use the office for another month since I haven't agreed on my office lease yet, and hopefully this will be confirmed by next week. I don't know what kind of reaction I was expecting, perhaps relief, but I didn't expect what I got. Darla burst into tears and ran into her bedroom. I was stunned and didn't know what to do. I tried to knock on her door, but Darla didn't answer. When I went to bed that night, I was deeply troubled. Although Darla and I were married, we were never intimate. Without a doubt, I cared for her and valued her very much. She was everything that Jenny was not. But the whole time I lived in her house, I was afraid of offending her, so I kept my distance. Apart from the occasional hug or kiss on the cheek, we each lived our own lives. I decided to talk to her in the morning. However, around midnight a severe thunderstorm broke out. Lightning struck quite close to the house. One blow was particularly close and the house shook and it woke me up. A few seconds later, my bedroom door opened and Darla walked in. Misha, please, I'm terribly afraid of thunderstorms, she whispered, trembling. Can I spend the night with you? Of course, I said, throwing back the blanket. Trembling, Darla clung to me. Then I realized that she was naked. Mike, I'm really scared because of the thunder and lightning, she whispered, shaking. I hugged her and pressed her to me. Before I knew what was happening, I was kissing her and Darla was kissing me back. Soon I began to explore her body with my hand while continuing to kiss her. Her breasts were soft, but her nipples were hard and erect. Please, Mike, I know you don't love me, but I need you to make love to me at least once before you leave. At that moment I realized that I had very deep feelings for Darla. It wasn't the passionate, hot love I felt for Jenny. It was something more mature, a friendship that grew into something much more over 18 months. Making love to Darla that night was the final piece in the puzzle that healed me. As I lay there sighing, I collapsed next to the woman I had been married to for 18 months and had never even kissed properly. Darla, I don't know if this is love or not, but I do know that I never want to leave you, I said, trying to calm my breathing. At first I thought of us only as friends, but my feelings for you grew month by month, and the last few months I wanted more, but I was afraid that you didn't feel the same. I couldn't risk you throwing me out if I tried to do anything. Oh, Mike, I loved you almost from the first time we met, but then you were married to Jenny, and I knew you were crazy about her. 
Then, when she left you and we came up with a plan to pretend to be married, I thought I might have a chance. But tonight when you said you were leaving, I was devastated. I love you so much. I will be a good wife. Please give me a chance. The only way I'll leave is if you kick me out yourself. I kissed her softly. This is my home, and you are my wife now and forever. After that night with Darla, we woke up the next morning to a clear, cloudless sky. Suddenly, I felt completely different about my ruined life. I experienced a terrible betrayal, but I came out of it in a much better situation than I ever could have imagined. The pain, anger, and loneliness disappeared. Now I could think about Jenny without feeling like something was squeezing my heart. I finally achieved the opposite of loving my ex-wife. I was indifferent to her. What was a fake marriage now became very real and loving. I decided that Darla and I should go on our honeymoon, so I asked her where she wanted to go to celebrate our finally realizing our deep feelings for each other. I expected her to say something like Paris or Hawaii. It wouldn't surprise me if she said Las Vegas, but she didn't want to go to any of those places. Darla wanted to go to Montana instead. Why Montana? I asked. My dad always told me stories about the ranch he worked on in Montana. He loved working there and it inspired him to buy his own ranch when he moved to Texas. Land was a lot cheaper back then. Anyway, I always wanted to see Montana, but I didn't want to go there alone. Why didn't he just buy a ranch in Montana? I asked. Because he hated the winters there. So we spent two weeks in Montana, driving around the state, and even spent a week on a working ranch. Darla came up with a ton of ideas for her ranch but the best part of the trip were the nights when we snuggled together and explored each other's bodies. The children were delighted when we picked them up. Then they told me something that upset me. Jenny and Brad flew to Eastern Europe because Brad was opening four new factories in three different countries. While they were away, they hired a nanny to look after Glenda and Mark. The children were unhappy being left with a 50-year-old nanny who wouldn't let them do anything except go to school, do their homework, and watch a little TV. The nanny couldn't swim, so they couldn't even use the pool. When Jenny picked up the kids two weeks later, I asked her about it. Jenny, the kids told me that you and Brad went to Europe and left them with a nanny. It's none of your business, Mike, so don't start, she said. I raised my hands in surrender. I'm not trying to start a fight. I just wanted to let you know that if you need to travel, we would be happy to take the kids instead of hiring a nanny. We were on a trip this time, so we couldn't help. Just saying that this is an option. The custody agreement is very clear. Two weeks here for you and two weeks for Brad and I, Jenny said in a sharp tone before telling the kids to get in the car. The next day I called Tom and told him about my conversation with Jenny and my proposal. He advised me to wait for it to happen again. Perhaps this was a one-time incident. It happened again six weeks later. I found out about this when I called the kids. Jenny and Brad went on a business trip again for a week. At this point, Tom filed for a modification of the terms of custody. When Jenny returned from Europe, she received notice of a court hearing to change the terms of her custody. She called me furious and told me in very rude words that hell would freeze over before she would agree to any changes to the custody agreement. Tom advised me that the court might side with Jenny. However, I told him I wanted to try. In court, Jenny's lawyer, Mr. Silas, looked less than pleased. I also thought it was weird that Brad wasn't there, just Jenny. Your Honor, this is a waste of time, stated Mr. Silas. The custody agreement has been working successfully for almost two years. My client sees no reason to change anything. Your Honor, we're just trying to do what's best for the kids, Tom countered, then laid out his argument. We understand that Mr. Carney Carlson has to travel frequently and naturally wants his wife to accompany him. All we ask of Mrs. Ray Carlson is that the children be allowed to stay with their father while she is away. And if Mrs. Char Carlson will return before her two weeks are up, and the children will be returned to her home at her convenience. Mr. Silas, do you have anything to add? The judge looked through his glasses. The custody arrangement is working, and Mrs. Carlson would prefer to leave things unchanged.
The judge looked between the two sides. Okay, it's a simple solution. Although I agree with Mr. House Silas that this custody agreement seems to be working well, and I fully understand that Mrs. Kowers Carlson will be accompanying her husband on many of these trips. However, it makes no sense to deny the children their father's company if the mother must be away. Therefore, I grant Mr. Pilsarian Wilson's motion to modify the terms of custody as proposed. I was amazed at the speed of the judge's decision and even more surprised that he ruled in my favor. But when I saw the cloud of anger over Jenny, I knew a storm was coming. Why are you so boring? Jenny demanded of me in the hallway after the hearing. Jenny, I don't understand what your problem is, but I'm tired of it, I replied. What's the big problem? You're not around, so why can't the kids stay with me? From what I hear, they have a lot more fun with me than with that Nazi you hired as a babysitter. Go to hell, Mike, she huffed and walked away. Do you understand what her problem is? I asked Tom. I can only guess, he replied. I think Jenny hates it when she's not in control. But more importantly, I think she's afraid the kids will love you more than they love her. You're probably right, I agreed with a sigh. Jenny keeps trying to poison the kids against me, and she always makes me wait 10 or 15 minutes when I pick them up. But I still don't understand. Jenny has everything she wants. Why would she ruin my life? Because she can, Tom said with a smile. Come on, you buy me lunch. Two years after that first night with Darla as a real married couple, we were blessed with the birth of a baby girl we named Wendy. Eighteen months after that, we had a boy, whom we named Stephen. Not only was Darla a wonderful mother, but Glenda was like a second mom and Mark became very protective of his new sibling. The next five years flew by in a flash. And during that time, I would say I spent 70 or 80 percent of the time with Mark and Glenda. Jenny and Brad seemed to jump all over the world. After our divorce, Jenny's contact with her parents was almost zero. They visited her and Brad maybe once or twice a year, usually at a restaurant for dinner. John and Alma were never invited to parties at Brad's house, nor were they ever asked to stay overnight at Jenny and Brad's house. On the other hand, Darla and I invited John and Alma over almost every weekend. The kids loved having them around, and I have to admit, I did too because they were like my second parents. Plus, I enjoyed talking with John about his life. He had an amazing catalog of jobs throughout his life, from working on a ranch to driving a truck to working in an auto body shop. He was also one of the workers involved in the construction of the original World Trade Center. John has worked in various areas of construction, carpentry, drywall installation, and electrical installation. He could even design a house and pour the foundation. He could do all this despite his physical limitations. Sometimes John talked about his time in Vietnam. In those rare moments when he spoke about his war experiences, wild horses could not have pulled me away from the chair next to him. He was a true American hero. It really bothered me that Jenny ignored her parents, and I know it hurt them deeply. I tried to talk to my ex-wife about her relationship with her parents and received the standard answer from her. Mind your own business. I continued to follow Jenny and Brad on social media because I found it interesting to see their lives and the children liked to see pictures of their mother in the newspapers. When we first separated, I watched carefully to see if Jenny and Brad's marriage would fail as I was sure it would. But as the years passed, Jenny and Brad seemed to be very happy. Although I never asked, according to Mark and Glenda, life in Brad's house was pleasant. The kids even liked Brad, and he seemed to treat them well. Well, he bought them a lot of things that, as always, children like. Unfortunately, Alma died of cancer about eight years after our divorce. She spent her last days on the ranch with us. The funeral, which was held locally, attracted a large crowd. The ranch had a private cemetery dating back to the 1870s, and John asked permission to bury Alma there. We, of course, agreed. John also asked permission to be buried next to her, and again we agreed. I wasn't sure if Jenny would come to the funeral because she had only spoken to her father once since her mother died, and that was when John called his daughter to tell her about her mother's death. However, Jenny came with Brad. 
She was wearing a dark blue dress and sunglasses. I was a little surprised by how Brad looked. His hair was starting to thin and gray, and he had a hint of a beer belly. It seemed to me that he spends too much time traveling, eating out, and not doing enough exercise. John stood up to greet his daughter, and it was an awkward moment. They just stood there looking at each other for what seemed like an eternity until John hugged his daughter. At first, Jenny just stood there, but then she slowly hugged her father. Brad then walked over and shook John's hand, expressing his condolences. Mark and Glenda, who had been crying, came up and hugged their mother. Brad turned to me, nodded, and grinned. I think he expected me to be nervous in his presence. Instead, I smiled, reached out, and shook his hand. When we tried to take seats in the first pew, there was not enough space. So I suggested that Brad and I sit in the second row. Brad was not happy about this, especially when John insisted that I sit next to him. Darla ended up taking my seat in the second row next to Brad. As the service began, I heard Brad grumbling from behind. Then I heard Darla hiss something back at him. After a moment, Brad stood up and left. When it was over, John invited Jenny and Brad back to the ranch for a burial and some food afterwards. But Jenny refused, apologizing that they needed to fly. I knew it was a lie, but I didn't say anything. After the graveside service, I caught Darla alone and asked what happened between her and Brad during the church service. He was angry because you sat in the front row with his wife, Darla said, shaking her head. But I sat on one side of John and Jenny on the other. We weren't sitting together. I pointed this out to the arrogant Mr. Gummy Carlson and then told him to shut up because the world doesn't revolve around him. Then Darla smiled mischievously. I think he was offended. We laughed about this incident, but we shouldn't have. Brad reacts poorly to people who do not show him the respect they deserve. In other words, he's a vindictive jerk who actually believes his shit doesn't stink. Two weeks later, Brad began another land grab at Darla's ranch. This time he claimed 10 acres of land adjacent to his territory. His lawyers found that the 10 acres were once a separate parcel, and due to a clerical error, they were never included in the single title to the rest of the ranch. Consequently, taxes were never assessed on these 10 acres. Brad had his accountants figure out what the taxes should be on 10 acres and paid that amount to the county. His lawyers then asked for a tax deed. Darla was upset by this requirement, even though the 10 acres were a mixture of marshy and rocky land. Darla asked me if she should just sign the land transfer since it wasn't worth much. Absolutely not, I said immediately. This is Brad showing his bully tendencies and trying to put you in your place for insulting him. Last time you didn't have the money to fight him. It's time for someone to stick a knife in his back and break him. His claim is false. As I predicted, the court sided with Darla. They said it was the county's mistake that taxes were not collected on the 10 acres. Additionally, it is also the county's responsibility to first notify the current owner and give him an opportunity to pay the back taxes. And to put an end to it, the court limited the tax debt to five years. I didn't see Brad in person for a long time after that. I saw him and Jenny in the public pages from time to time. At the same time, I rarely saw Jenny. More often than not, when I came to pick up the children, one of the staff was already preparing them at the front door, which was normal. Jenny also continued to miss time with the children as Brad traveled more and more. As the years went by, I estimated that I had the children for about nine months out of the year, and it got to the point where they were disgusted with going back to their mother and Brad's house. They complained that Brad became moody and their mother was away from home most of the time. Then sensational news appeared in the newspapers. Brad filed for divorce from Jenny. This was a complete surprise to me, and I could not understand why. The kids were just as confused as I was. But as the weeks passed, rumors spread that Brad had caught Jenny cheating on him with Ted Dumont, a billionaire. This explanation spoke volumes. Jenny decided to climb the social ladder again. Tad was not only richer than Brad, but also much younger. Darla and I couldn't help but laugh at this turn of events. Shortly after Brad and Jenny's divorce was finalized, Jenny married Tad. It worked out well for me.
Tad did not live in the Chesterton School District. Besides, he didn't particularly like children. So, essentially, Glenda and Mark lived with Darla and I full-time. Shortly after Alma died, I convinced John to sell his house and move in with us. And because John knew all about construction, Darla hired him to do some renovations on the ranch. Darla and I then decided to expand the house to provide a dining room for the ranch staff and to expand my accounting office. This caused another fight with Brad. He tried his best to get our building permits denied. In the end, we were given permits because we were listed as inheritable rights. John took charge of this new construction and did about 85% of the work himself. A little over a year after Ted and Jenny married, Jenny filed for divorce. The rumor was that Jenny caught Ted with a girl. Then another rumor surfaced that ended up being true. Tad married Jenny only because he didn't love Brad and decided to take his wife away from him. This is karma. Now every morning when I wake up, I thank God for all the blessings he has given me. As the years went by, we had our ups and downs, as well as one terrible tragedy. Mark was in a car accident that could have killed him. However, he was lucky he only broke his leg and wrist and also suffered abrasions and cuts. John suffered a mild stroke, which left him slightly paralyzed on his left side. Physiotherapy has worked wonders for him, and he now walks with only a slight limp. Darla never seemed to get sick. She told me she didn't have time to be sick because of her four kids, the ranch and me. I, on the other hand, am very lucky. I felt unwell for several weeks. I had no energy and suffered from headaches and nausea. I continued to ignore it until one day Darla took me by the hand and led me to the doctor's office. After a series of tests, they determined that one of my arteries was so blocked that I was like a ticking bomb, ready to have a heart attack at any moment. They performed surgery and did a triple bypass. After the surgery, although I was still in the hospital bed, I couldn't believe how much better I felt. Fortunately, Glenda and Alma suffered only from common childhood illnesses. However, unfortunately, Stevie died of cancer at the age of seven. He was a courageous little boy who rarely complained, even when I knew he was suffering. The night Stevie died, Darla and I crawled into his bed and held him between us. Mom, Dad, I'm really glad that you are here with me. Now I'm not afraid, he said, closing his eyes. Stevie exhaled his last breath a few minutes later. Darla was absolutely devastated and is still taking antidepressants. Our other children cried on and off for weeks. And I admit, it was the darkest day of my life. It made me realize that everything I went through when Jenny betrayed me was nothing compared to losing Stevie. Darla and I struggled for a long time with our loss. There was a hole in my heart that did not begin to heal until my first grandchild was born. Glenda gave birth to a boy and named him Stephen Todd. She named her son after her brother and her husband Todd. All the children are now married and we have seven grandchildren. And with the birth of each new grandchild, my heart healed a little more. However, there is still a small part of me that feels the loss. Sometimes, when a random thought about Stevie pops into my head, I feel a twinge of sadness. We buried Stevie next to his grandmother. There were supposed to be about 300 people in the service. The only person who didn't come was Jenny. She was somewhere in Europe, South America, or somewhere else with another boyfriend. To be honest, I didn't care where she was, and to tell the truth, I was glad she didn't come. I was in too much pain to face her. It was a very difficult six months after Stevie died. Sometimes I would wake up at night and find that Darla had disappeared. I knew where she went, so I took a blanket and walked to Stevie's grave. Then I lay down next to my wife and covered us both with a blanket. Even many years after my son's death, I sometimes went to Stevie's grave. I just sat there and talked to him. It somehow always helped me find solace. If you're wondering if I ever thought about getting back with Jenny after she became free, the answer is no. The thought had never occurred to me until Darla brought it up. One night after dinner, while we were watching TV, Darla asked, Have you ever thought about going back to Jenny? Darla tried to pretend it was just a random question, but I could see the fear in her eyes. Without a word, I stood up and pulled her to her feet. 
I kissed her passionately and then dragged her into the bedroom. I practically tore her clothes off while I took mine off. Two hours later I asked Darla, what were you asking? Okay, whatever, she said, snuggling closer to me. One day I saw an elderly man in my waiting room, so I went to see what I could do to help. When he raised his head, I was shocked. It was Brad. Brad, this is unexpected, I said, holding out my hand. Brad shook my hand weakly. He didn't look well, but before I could say anything, he spoke. You won, he said sadly. What did I win? I asked in bewilderment. I really loved her, Brad continued, and I thought she loved me too. Then it dawned on me that he was talking about Jenny. So I said, yes, she has the ability to make people fall in love with her. But Jenny has always had a serious flaw. She was born poor and never got over it. She thinks more money means more happiness. Now I understand how you felt when Jenny left you, Brad admitted. How did you cope? One day at a time and with the help of a loving woman, I answered honestly. There is no magic cure. Brad sighed. It's too late for me to look for someone else. Besides, I love Jenny with all my heart. But that's not why I came. I'm here because I have stage four cancer and I wanted to apologize to you. I knew what was wrong courting a married woman, but I just fell in love with Jenny. I hope that someday you can forgive me. As I looked at this old man in front of me, I was struck by the fact that I had once hated him with all my being. But now I just felt sorry for him. Brad, there was a time when I hated you, I admitted. But that time has long passed. And if you want my forgiveness, you have it. He smiled sadly, thanked me and left. He died five months later. Darla and I attended his funeral. I was surprised how few people came. However, one of those present was Jenny, and she seemed very upset about Brad leaving, and even more upset about me. You should have come and enjoyed yourself, shouldn't you? Jenny exclaimed. You couldn't just let me bury him in peace. You wanted everyone to see that you won. I was furious. You're a hypocrite. You left him for a man with a lot of money, and now you're crying crocodile tears because he's dead. Brad apologized to me a few months ago, and I accepted his apology. Have you ever apologized to Brad for letting him be betrayed? I didn't wait for an answer. I took Darla by the hand, and we left. The drive home was quiet for quite a while, but then Darla turned to me and asked, Who put it in your cereal this morning? I couldn't help but burst out laughing. Darla always had a way of making me laugh. When Brad's will became public knowledge, I was surprised. Oh, he left the bulk of his fortune to charities and his alma mater. But he also left two million dollars to Jenny. With inheritances from two wealthy husbands, plus this latest inheritance, Jenny was well provided for. She bought a condo near the ranch and tried to reconnect with her children. However, the children really didn't want to spend time at their mother's condo. Since it was intended for single middle-aged people, they complained that there was nothing to do there. But I told them that their mother was trying, and they should try too. In the end, the distance turned out to be too great. Jenny eventually gave in and found a new boyfriend. Since then, Jenny has been going through boyfriends like some people go through socks. The children seemed happy not spending time at their mother's house and if they were happy, then I was happy. I was extremely proud of our children. Mark graduated from Georgia Tech with a degree in engineering. He works and lives in Austin. He married a lovely girl from Ohio, Cindy Stubbins, whom he met at GT. She is also an engineer, and they work in the same company. They have two beautiful girls, and Cindy works from home. Glenda attended Texas A&M to become a veterinarian. After graduating, she returned home and worked for a local veterinarian, Sam Turner, for two years. She then branched off and opened her own practice. About a year later, a young veterinarian, Todd Amberson, bought Sam's practice. It was probably inevitable, but eventually Glenda and Todd merged their practices and merged their lives when they got married. They have two boys and a girl, and I swear my grandchildren spend more time at the ranch than at home. Not only do Darla and I love having them around, but Jenny's grandfather probably spends more time with the kids than anyone else. 
they absolutely adore him. My daughter Alma graduated from the University of Texas with a teaching degree. She now teaches third grade at Chesterton Elementary School. She married her college boyfriend, Jerry, who teaches at Marion High School. He is a chemistry teacher, and they're expecting their first child in three months, give or take a few days. I couldn't be happier because I adore my grandchildren. They are better than your own children. I'm kidding, but there's something about grandchildren. You can spoil them to the point of exhaustion, and when they become capricious and irritable, you simply return them to their parents. Mark married a beautiful girl he met while on holiday in England. No, she's not British. She's just an American who is also on vacation. Her name is Sally. She is short only five feet. She has long, dark black hair and purple eyes. I joke that she's a mini Elizabeth Taylor. They have three children, two boys and a girl, and we just found out she's pregnant with her fourth. It amazes me how easily Sally has babies considering how small she is. The years continued to tick by, and before I knew it, Darla and I celebrated our 30-year wedding anniversary. I haven't seen Jenny much in recent years. Children talk to their mother from time to time, but rarely see her. According to the children, time is beginning to catch up with their mother, as it happens to all of us. She's not the desirable woman she used to be, and apparently she hasn't had a boyfriend in a couple of years. Jenny called her father once every two months. He was approaching 90 years of age, but still moved well and was as witty as ever. Conversations between father and daughter were always quite short and always left John a little depressed. When I once asked him why he didn't talk to Jenny more, he admitted that he just didn't know what to tell her. This made me sad for John. Another Christmas was quickly approaching, so I went to the mall to do some Christmas shopping. I've long accepted that I'm absolutely useless at choosing gifts, so I just find out what stores my family likes to buy from. Then I go there and buy gift cards. I know it sounds so callous, but this way I will never go wrong with the size, color, or anything else, and so far I have not received a single complaint. Just when I bought the last card and was feeling hungry, I headed to the food court to order a chick fill a sandwich and lemonade. I was just about to take the first piece when I recognized the woman sitting two tables away from me. It was Jenny. She sat alone, watching people pass by. She looked especially interested at the families filling the mall. Jenny was no longer the beautiful woman I married. She gained 15 pounds and developed wrinkles. Even from where I was, I could see the pigment spots on her hands. However, she looked attractive for her age but there was this loneliness in her eyes that really caught my attention. I decided to take a chance and join her. Hey, do you mind if I join you? I asked, placing my sandwich and drink on the table. What do you want? Jenny barked. I was surprised by her hostility. It took me a minute to process this, but then I grabbed my sandwich and drank. I don't want anything. I was just going to say hi. Look, I'm sorry to bother you. I don't want to start a fight, so I'll just find another table. A flash of pain flashed across Jenny's face, and she sank a little. No, sorry. The holidays seem to bring out the worst in everyone. Please sit down. I'd like some company. Are you shopping for Christmas? I asked and took a bite of my chicken sandwich. Mike, I haven't done any Christmas shopping since Brad and I got divorced. Now I just mail checks and the kids really appreciate them, especially the ones for the grandchildren. They put that money into college funds. I know, Jenny replied, watching the young couple push a baby stroller past. They tell me in thank you notes. So, back to the original question, what brought you to the mall? As far as I remember, you never really liked shopping. If you wanted something, you just went to the store, bought it, and went home. I just wanted to be around people, Jenny said wistfully as she watched another young couple try to gather their three children. Everyone in my building is gone for the holidays. So what are you going to do for Christmas? You're not going to sit alone in your apartment, are you? Of course not, Jenny replied sharply. I have a reservation at Shea Francesca, and then I plan to see the new Tom Hanks movie. No, you won't, I said, finishing my sandwich. You'll come to the ranch for Christmas. 
All the kids and grandkids will be there, as well as your dad. It'll be fun. I can't do that, Jenny protested. I'll make everyone feel uncomfortable. Nonsense, I said, collecting my trash. Everything is decided. You will come. Then, as I walked away, I turned around and said, If you want to see your grandchildren open presents, come at seven in the morning. But come whenever you want. Lunch will be at three. Darla wasn't happy when I told her that Jenny might be coming for Christmas. Why did you invite her? She asked, jealousy and uncertainty flashing in her eyes. I quickly hugged my wife and kissed her. Is my wife jealous? Stop it, Mike. I'm serious, Darla's eyes flashed. She'll make everyone feel uncomfortable. That's what Jenny said when she tried to refuse, but I couldn't let her spend the day alone. What's all this talk about Jenny? John asked as he entered the room. I invited Jenny to join us for Christmas, I told the man I considered my second father. And she said she was coming. John's eyes lit up, and I saw that Darla noticed it too. Not really, I explained. Jenny tried to refuse because she thought she would make everyone feel uncomfortable, but I wouldn't accept no. Now the decision is hers. The light of hope in John's eyes faded, but was quickly restored. On Christmas Day, Jenny didn't show up to watch her grandchildren open presents, and she didn't show up for lunch at three o'clock. By this time, I already thought that she would not come, and it seemed that John thought so too. He looked sad and sat on the side alone. I felt sorry for him and finally sent my youngest granddaughter, Christy, who was four years old, to pick him up to play her game. Just as I knew, he was soon sitting on the floor playing Candleland. Around 5.30, I was surprised to hear the front door ring. When I opened the door, I was surprised to find Jenny. She was dressed as if she was going to dinner. Hi, I said kindly. I'm already starting to lose hope in you. I still think it might be a mistake, she said with uncertainty in her eyes. Nothing like that, I assured her. You missed lunch, but we'll be serving dessert soon. If you want something to eat, I can warm you up a plate of leftovers. No, dessert sounds great, Jenny said as I escorted her inside. Hey guys, I yelled to everyone in the family room, look who I found. Jenny's here for dessert. The grandchildren attacked her in a crowd. They had just chosen teams for some game, and everyone wanted Jenny to be on their team. Mark and Glenda walked over and hugged and kissed their mother, wishing her a Merry Christmas. In fact, all the kids hugged her. However, to my surprise, Darla hugged and kissed Jenny too. The evening passed very pleasantly. Jenny was very nervous at first and weighed every word that was said to her. But when she finally realized that she was the only one feeling out of place, she began to relax. It was touching to see Jenny and her father sitting together, talking and laughing. All in all, it was a very satisfying Christmas. Although Jenny had calmed down since she first arrived, it was clear that she was still unsure of her presence here in Darla's house and mine, and I have to admit, I watched Jenny sometimes. She was still an attractive woman, but I was surprised that I had no feelings for her other than the fact that she was the mother of my two children. After the grandchildren went to bed, their parents decided to use the hot tub. Since it was 34 degrees Fahrenheit outside, it didn't interest Darla, Jenny, or me. John decided to try it, but returned a few minutes later, saying that you would have to be crazy to sit in a bathtub, even if it was heated at that temperature. So I got everyone drinks, and we sat by the fireplace with the Christmas tree twinkling on the side. We sat in silence for about 15 minutes, watching the flames dance around the logs. At some point, I noticed tears sliding down Jenny's cheeks. Are you okay? I asked, not understanding the reason for the tears. I'll be fine. Jenny replied in a small voice, wiping away her tears. Neither Darla nor I said anything about the tears and let the silence surround us again. After another five minutes of silence, Jenny began to speak. I almost changed my mind about coming, she said, looking into the fire. I was afraid to find out what I almost certainly knew. I really ruined my life. Oh, I think you judge yourself too harshly, Darla was surprised to hear. I saw pictures of you and Brad, and it was obvious that you loved him. 
and I would say the same about Ted. No marriages work out, but 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Oh, I really loved Brad in the beginning, although I still loved you too, Mike. But I loved his money and power more. We got along well for many years, but I allowed him to alienate me from the children. And since he was 15 years older than me, his age began to take its toll. He began to have health problems that affected his performance in bed. He became irritable and angry. I started cheating on Brad about six months before I got involved with Ted. In his eyes, the same pain and hatred that I saw in yours, Mike. Almost from the very beginning of our marriage, I suspected Tad of cheating. And when I caught him, he just laughed at me. He said that he hated Brad because of what? Deal and married me just to piss him off. I was devastated and suddenly realized how you and Brad felt. After I got rid of Tad, I decided that I was done with marriage. I would just enjoy my life. More than enough money to do whatever I wanted, so I got involved in one loveless adventure after another. I was so selfish that I put my own desires before the interests of my children. I'm surprised they don't hate me. That was as close to an apology as Jenny could get. After a few more minutes of silence, Jenny drained her glass and stood up. I have to go. Darla, John and I tried to convince Jenny to stay the night, but she refused. So John and I walked her to the car. Her father hugged her tightly and told her he loved her. This brought Jenny to tears again. She wiped them off, and before getting into the car, she hugged me tightly and said, Thank you. Then Jenny left. I don't know what the future holds for us. I truly believe that Jenny truly regrets many of her life choices. Whether she tries to reconnect with her family is up to her. The house is now silent except for the occasional crackle or crackle from the fireplace. I couldn't help but think about how sad my ex-wife was, and yes, I felt sorry for her. For me, I'd like to kick myself for all the time I spent trying to find a way to get back at Jenny and Brad. As I sat and watched the dancing flames, I was reminded of the Bible verse. Race is not for the swift, nor battle for the strong, nor food for the wise, nor wealth for the wise, nor favor for the learned, but time and chance happen to everyone. As it turned out, time was the best revenge. Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think click to the next one.